Hello, 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 you guys. Welcome back to Saved Not Soft. I'm your host, Emmy Moore, and welcome to this podcast. If this is your first time, I'm so blessed that you're here and that you stumbled across me, and I hope you get something out of today's message. Uh, God, to keep it a buck, I feel like I got socks in my sternum. I just feel so Holy Spirit slapped. I feel like I, have you ever seen Doctor Strange and the ancient one hits him and then he goes into all these different dimensions and through all these different like things in like a millisecond? That's how I feel like these past few days were. I feel like I went through 20 years (laughs) of knowledge and healing in about like four days, not 20, but I'm exaggerating just a little bit, but sorry, kind of like rambling a little bit in the beginning. Uh, if you're new here, welcome. Uh, if you're coming back, welcome back. Uh, also if my voice is kind of like a little raspy, even though I think it kind of sound a little cute, uh, it's because I've been screaming and up really late the past few days. I'll get into as to why, but, um, yeah, you guys, uh, it, everything's so timely of how God works. Um, because last week or two weeks ago, I was crying (laughs) and upset and stressed out and, um, got really vulnerable with you guys. And I really do feel as if God is wanting to shift the trajectory of this podcast and how things are going to go delivery wise. Um, I want it. I, I want here and out for the here and on out for things to be more vulnerable and transparent. Uh, not meaning I'm gonna come on here and cry all the time. No, that's not what I want. <laughs> but uh, I want to be really real on here, and I feel like I've always been real on here. But I feel like I've also kind of kept some things in the back. Um, not like I owe you guys anything, but I, I do believe when you're more transparent, people can learn from your testimony more. And vulnerability is is what people cling on to. So God is just posturing me to be more vulnerable about what this lo- walk looks like. Because like I say, every single week, shall we say it together? This is not a soft walk. This is not an easy walk. This is hard. This is hard. This isn't something that just a little stroll like Noah's narrow and it's it, you need light. And if you stumble in the darkness, you're going to get lost. And navigating that is difficult. And being a Christian woman, a woman of God, it still gets hard. And I, I just want to be a transparent because I think especially with social media, There's like, oh my gosh, she's purely sanctified and she's not doing this. And oh my gosh, this woman, she, she's just such a great woman of God. She does not mess up. I aspire to be like her when we should actually be looking to Jesus as the example. And I think we need to kind of put the idea back into our minds, into reality that everybody messes up. There's not one woman of God or not one man of God that is perfect. There's no way. So how can I speak to the reality by being relatable and being vulnerable? Because I think a lot of pastors and teachers and even YouTubers will go on a platform and say, you know what, like you should do this, 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 and this, and this. And they live a simple life as well, along as everybody else. And I think we could grow better as a church and be more unified if we're more transparent and vulnerable about our struggles and our trans and our transgressions, um, because when we do that, we allow the grace of God to fill those empty spaces. So that's kind of uh, I, I'm kind of starting this with a different approach. Um, but I need to tell y'all what happened last week. I was gonna do like a whole topic, like how I usually do, which we're gonna get back to um, probably next week. But I just really need a. Actually, today is a topic, because. I've been going through a series of things the past few days that all correlated with one another. This is a word. I feel like people are going to get saved from this message. And I think people are going to let go of things that they haven't been able to let go of for years. And God 
moved so intentionally and it would be selfish of me to just keep this in and not tell anybody about it. Uh, so yeah, story time, <laughs> a long story time, but a lesson tied to it and a, on a, an amazing word attached to it. And, oh, God just moves. I, I can't wait to tell y'all because I'm so ecstatic and happy. Uh, where do I want to start? I initially wanted to make a, uh, episode, which I'm, I think I might do next week about gossip. Uh, because with us women, that gets kind of challenging because a lot of, a lot of girls be some haters. Let's be for real. (laughs) Even if it's unconsciously. So I was like in the works of writing that. And, uh, I met up with my mentor two weeks ago about, uh, I, I speak on Monday nights at their um, worship nights. And so he told me he wanted me to speak. I said, okay. But I met with him two weeks ago. I told him what God put on my heart, what book. Ruth came to mind. I read the book of Ruth and we just dissected it together and uh, just saw what God was telling us in the midst of that. And we just kind of formulated this sermon together um, to speak that following Monday, uh, to, to the worship night. And so the worship night comes and I'm prepared to, to talk about this, uh, this sermon with, uh, Ruth and Boaz, and I'm going to explain it to y'all. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what I, what I said, because exactly what I said happened to me. It was funny. It was like, I'd, I'd, I'd like delivered the sermon, like Jesus used me to deliver this to people. And then it was funny because he like used my words against me, <laughs> which was hilarious, but, uh, it, it was such a blessing at the same time. And the, the topic of, of the sermon and the point I wanted to get across of what me and my pastor were trying to implement is that God is a redeemer, Right. And I told the story of Ruth. If you don't know it, I will tell you basically right now. Ruth was a Moabite. She was a widow. Her husband died tragically. And so did his brother. And so did their sons. Like pretty much the worst thing happened. (laughs) She lost her husband. She lost all of her money. She lost everything. And she had to leave her city with her and her sister. And they went... And they went and stayed with her mother-in-law, Naomi. And Naomi was like, hey, like, y'all could go back to your old life. You could go back to your old town. And you don't have to stay with me. She was actually urging Ruth to go back to her city. She's like, you're not going to find nobody here because you're enemies with these people. You're not going to... You're not going to find anyone. You're not going to marry anyone. Like, just go back home. And Ruth's sister went back to Moab. And Ruth stayed faithful to Naomi. And I really do believe that Ruth had some sort of, I don't know. I I think we just see Ruth's faithfulness in this, right? And Ruth stuck by Naomi. And that's pretty much what, like, chapter one of Ruth is, is about. Is, okay, this is her tragedy. She's sticking with, Ruth is sticking to Naomi and Ruth's sister dipped on her to go back to her old life. And I think that's such a, such a crazy thing to bring up is that Ruth left to, to be with Naomi while her sister left to go back to her old ways while Ruth stayed faithful. Ruth stayed faithful to Naomi and her sister dipped on it back to their old life. Back, back back to her old ways. And in Ruth chapter 2, it talks about how Ruth gets up and goes to the field and work. And to keep it a buck, the whole reason why I went to this chapter is because I heard in a sermon, uh, he was like, you know, know what? I'm actually going to save it. I shouldn't say that right now. Sorry, I'm not in like sermon mode. <laughs> I feel like when I when I film a podcast and then when I'm speaking a sermon, it's way differently. Like when I'm on here, I'm talking to y'all like you're in the room, like you're my friend. But when I'm speaking a sermon, it's a lot more orchestrated and detailed and more organized, I guess. So I'm just kind of rambling. Um, but anyways, Ruth got up and went to work and she told Naomi, 
okay, I'm going to go to the fields and glean. And if you don't know what it means to glean, what it means to glean is to basically pick up all the leftover harvest, the stuff that has hit the floor, the stuff that is gross and dirty. That's what she went and did for work. So she's like, okay, I'm going to go to the field and go glean. I'll be right back. Okay, Naomi. She's like, okay. And Ruth goes into the field and she's gleaning and this man Boaz comes into the field and he and he's the one who owns the field this this big man of the field okay and he sees her gleaning and he tells her to to not glean anywhere else he he calls her and says you know come here <laughs> and what i love about the story is that he sees that she's picking up scraps and the leftovers and she's lost everything and boaz recognizes ruth and he says, what is the verse? It's Ruth 2, 11 through 12. He notices her and he says, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland to come and live with the people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under those wings, under whose wings uh." You have come to take refuge. Why is this so significant? And I, this is what I was going to say earlier. The whole reason why I went to this chapter in the first place is because I heard a pastor once say that Ruth didn't go into the field to find Boaz. Ruth just went up and went to work. <laughs> she just went up and went to work. She didn't know Boaz was going to be there. She didn't know that Boaz was going to notice her, let alone redeem her. And she she expresses her gratitude towards him and he tells her, don't glean anywhere else. Stay with me. And she ate with him. He gave her so much food and harvest to where she was bringing back leftovers. And she's going up to the crib and they owe me like, what? How? Where did you get all of this from? And she's like, I met this man who redeems me more than what I could have asked for. And we have to remember that Ruth was a widow. Ruth was lost. She felt like she had no value. And yet Boaz saw her, redeemed her, and gave her more than what she ever asked for. All just because she went up and went to work in faith. She stayed faithful to Naomi. She went up, went to the field to glean, not knowing or expected that she was about to be redeemed. Why is this important? Because that is an exact parallel of how Christ treats us. We are Ruth. We pick up the scraps. We are the ones who get the leftovers. We are lost. We are burdened. We are widows. But when Christ redeems us and looks at us and notices our transgressions, notices our pain, our hurt, our sufferings, our wounds, our burdens, he gives us more than we've asked for. He redeems us. He loves us. He sits and eats with us. He takes notice of us when we don't even deserve it. And this is the whole reason as to why Jesus died on the cross for us. Romans 5, 8. For Christ died for us, knowing that we were sinners. Although we were sinners, Christ died. He shed his blood for something I don't, I don't even deserve. And I, I just want to let that love resonate. That Christ notices you, that he sees you. And all the things that have hurt you in the past are, are worth to be redeemed. You are worth to be redeemed. And what I didn't know when I spoke the sermon is that I was about to be redeemed. And I didn't even know it. I walked into a field not knowing I was going to get leftover harvest. And that was the day it started was on Monday. So I speak this over people and I felt the Holy Spirit so heavy on it. And I just saw this, this hope in people, which this, this story should give you hope because we have nothing to offer. Yet Christ still looks at us at, whoa. What just came out of my mouth? Yet Christ still looks at us and is still is pleased with us. There's so many things I've done to hurt him. There's so many things I've done 
that have slapped him across the face and disrespected him. And yet he approaches me and wants to provide and redeem me. Like, I I want y'all to really settle on that. And everything, everything that's in the Bible replicates Jesus. You can pull any page out of the Bible and it's going to be talking about Jesus. Even if it's genealogy, everything in that book is about Jesus. If this is the, that parallel, God redeems, Jesus redeems. I speak this over people and I'm like, okay, God, that was a, that was a good little sermon. I'll take good. Thank you, Jesus, for using me. Thank you for speaking. Like, that was good. I, I see that people were helped, that some people are are coming to you and real, willing to just be in a, in a posture for you to redeem them and, like, this hope, right? And uh, I was at this worship night, and I poured my heart out of worship, and uh, my mom actually came to to worship night, um, to watch me speak. And I don't even think it was just that. I don't think, I mean, I think she came to watch me speak, but I think most importantly, she needed to come for her own spiritual walk. Me, like I've told y'all before, very straight up. I did not grow up Christian. The word of God was not implemented in my household. So me and my parents and let alone my whole family are on completely different walks because I haven't learned anything from them, which is fine. Um, and she went and there was like this, because we've had a very hard relationship, this like redeeming moment, I guess. And I felt really uncomfortable <laughs> and confused because I didn't expect it. And also it's like, I don't know how to explain it. It was like, okay, the thing that I, I I just spoke about, I'm experiencing it. And why does my flesh hate what's happening in my spirit? And that whole night, my mind was just kind of like angry. Like I just felt very bitter. I just felt really ticked off. And I um, I come back and I hang out with my friends and I and I like tell them what's going on in my mind. I'm like, I don't know why my spirit's like agitated. Like, it's like I've been praying to be seen, loved, and heard, and hugged on. And then it's like, I get it. And then it's like, I'm angry. And I think it's because there's a part of me, and this is just like trauma that's surpassed in my life, like that uh, people aren't genuine with me and people don't uh, really value or appreciate me unless if it's out of their own benefit, uh, just because that has happened to me as a kid, especially from my parents. So when I actually finally get the love and the appreciation, I don't believe it. And that doesn't make it right whatsoever. That's just my trauma speaking. So um, the next few days I was just kind of trying to get rid of this bitterness and this this anger that I was having because it was like, okay, I, I love that my mom showed up for church, but why am I angry? <laughs> it's just so weird because it contradicts one another. And um, I'm trying to like figure out this bitterness thing. A few days come by, go by, and my friend Clarissa comes down and she stays the night for a few nights because we plan to go to this worship night with circuit riders and lifestyle Christianity in Fresno. And um, my friends out in circuit riders, which is like Zach Webb, Steve O, and Caleb, they um, came out and they spoke and they worshiped. And that was kind of the answer to like my bitterness and all this other stuff that was coming up, like this anger of like, why do I feel like, just like the past, even like six months, I feel like I haven't been able to be like physically affectionate. My best friend, Annika, like she, um, her love language is physical touch and I absolutely despise it. When people hug me, I don't like it. When people like touch my hand or my, my leg, it makes me so uncomfortable. Um, so that was like kind of like a, a battle, um, that I was going through and just, just like all these things kind of came up last week. Just like, I'm annoyed that people are touching me. I'm annoyed that people are hugging me and showing compassion towards me because I don't trust it. 
and I'm angry because I feel like no one's really being sincere. And the whole reason why I think that way is I, th- my flesh believes that people aren't genuine because not a lot of people say sorry to me. And I love to be forgiving and it's hard for me to forgive people when they haven't said sorry. So when the same people who have caused trauma on me are hugging me and crying in my arms, it's hard for me to be happy about it. And that I'm working on that. I'm being so transparent because I know people relate to this and I'm not going to say I'm, I'm going to sit here and be happy all the time. Like this is, this is like some trauma stuff that this bitterness, this anger that I don't want anymore, but my flesh and my spirit just like don't align on it because my spirit wants to show compassion and hug people and love on people. And then my like flesh side doesn't. And it's like, it freaking sucks, dude. It's like the worst war ever because it's like, how can I love people? But then whenever I try to receive it, I feel uncomfortable. When we go to this worship night, I'm taking this to the Lord because it was bugging me all week. And Zach uh, went to say, he was like, yo, if, if you're not coming to the altar to sacrifice something like that's what worship is it has nothing to do with our glory but everything to do with God's he said if you're not coming here to give something you might as well just leave and I walk into that house like anxious from the back I I was really really anxious I was really really fed up and I was just confused so while he's saying this I'm like, God, what do I need to what what do I need to give to you? Cause I know you're gonna use me. I know you're gonna have me speak over people and love on people. And I, I know you're gonna use me tonight. I know you're gonna put me to work. But like, what do I need to give up to do that? Cause I just felt like this urge from the Lord, like even days before that at this worship night, he was gonna use me somehow to help somebody. Um, so I'm like, God, I know I'm gonna have to do stuff, but I can't if I'm anxious. So why what am I so anxious about? We start going into worship and the anxiousness just happens more. And I'm I'm just like trip. It felt like I drank like four Red Bulls. My heart was beating so fast. My knees were getting weak. I felt like I was going to fall to the floor. I was sweating. And I see my friend Caleb from across the crowd. I go up to him and I had seen him in person in a minute. And I was like, hey, what's up? What's up? He was like, oh, what's up? But I was like, sorry to like, you know, uh, but I need prayer really bad. I do not feel good. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he pulls me to the side and pulls his friend and they start praying over me, over my anxiousness and just like, uh, just like all the icky stuff that was going on. And even, even before all this, when I talked to Zach before, he was like, the enemy, the enemy has been trying to stop this gathering all day. Like little inconveniences were happening all day. And even same with me, like there was a whole bunch of inconvenient stuff happening and it was just irritating me. And then we get there, I'm anxious and I'm like, bro, what do I feel like this? And they pray over me and I told them, thank you. And I go back to my seat and I still felt anxious. And I was like, okay, then this is an anxiety. That was the first thing I thought. I was like, if, I, if I'm back at my seat and they just prayed over me and they prayed for the spirit of anxiety to be gone, my body's not tripping over anxiety. This is something else. Because I, prayer works. So I'm like sitting there and I'm on the floor and I'm crying out to God because I couldn't stand. My knees were so weak. I was like, God, what is it that you need me to do? And he says, I need you to give me him. He goes, I need you to give me your first father. And I'm sitting there like, oh, <laughs> what? I was like, God, you my first father. I put you first. He's like, let's be real. He says, I, I need you to give me him. And the Lord takes me out of the room. Like when I mean this, I've, I've said this before. If you don't know, I'm going to say right now, uh, one of my spiritual gifts is visions, very vivid visions, whether if it's in dreams or whether if it's in person, God 
will show me things that are absolutely insane. While we were worshiping, he like took me out of the room I was worshiping in. I didn't even hear the music anymore. And I was in this, this like shack, like this cabin. And I was hugging something and my face was buried into its chest and it felt loving and it felt nice. And I, I felt, I felt loved in that moment. And Jesus says, pick your head up. And I pick my head up and I see that I'm hugging my dad, like my birth dad. And it was so weird because it felt like I was actually hugging him. I felt like I was actually holding on to him. It felt like it was it was him that I was holding on to. And then God gives me like an outside perspective and I'm three. I'm not three. I'm five. <laughs> I'm a liar. I spoke over with somebody that night that they were three. I was five in that vision. I was five in that vision. Sorry. I was five. It's definitely not three. I was five. And God looks at both of us and he said, this is the love that I love. And he says, look around. I'm looking around in this house and I'm holding on. I'm a five-year-old holding on to my dad. And then I see all these men in my house. This is probably the greatest vision I've ever had in my entire life. I've had men that I talked to from like four years ago up in this house. I had a man in there that I talked to like last week in that house. My best friend was in that joint. My brothers were in that joint. Close friends since childhood was in that joint. Like all these men were in this house. And the house looked dirty. Like there was no lights. It was dark. The plates were broken. The dishes were overflowing. The counters are messy. Everything's torn up. The walls are cracking, molding. And I look at all these men and they all got dust on them. Like, they dusty? They got bums? Like, are they bums, God? Is that what you're trying to tell me? Like, the guys I talk to wear bums. <laughs> and he says, while your head was too busy being buried in the thing that was wounding you, you let all of these people in to your safe space, to your secret place. And I'm like, what? This is my secret place? Because I already have a secret place. When I pray to God, I, I imagine myself in this like Spanish castle and me and him always sit by this big old pool that I, that I have in my secret place and we'll dance and swim in the water and we'll talk always by the pool. And I was like, God, we got, a, we got a secret place. He's like, no, this is like five-year-old you secret place. It's a shack. Things are broken. And while you're too busy having your head be buried in a chest of somebody who's wounding you, all these men are hurting your household or hurting other people in that household. And little five-year-old me is like, what? And he says, you need to look at these things in the eye and tell them to leave. Because every single one of them must go. Because this place cannot be refurnished until it's an empty house. And so, in this vision, I kid you not, like, I had to look at every single man and say, get out, get out, get out. Like, it was, I, like, said their name, and I looked at them in the eye, and I said, get out. And I told you, this goes from friends to past relationships to past sneaky links. I kid you not. Like, people... I, People's names I've even thought about in years came up. Even just like people I love, I had to tell them to get out. Because I was putting all of those men before Jesus. All of those men I were putting before Jesus. So I had to get out, get out, get out. And this whole time I'm like hugging on to, to my dad in this, in this vision. And I'm crying and I'm sobbing and I'm five and I'm like, I can't, I can't let this go. Like I told Jesus, cause he's like watching me tell everyone to get out. 
And then Jesus said, no more. And I told him, I said, I can't. I can't. I can't let this go. And he said, why are you scared? And I said, I'm scared. Not because I'm scared to let go, but I'm scared because I'm afraid it won't come back. And Jesus spoke over me. He said, you need to trust me before you trust him. And Emmy, you're not going to have to let go because you're going to have to watch him walk out the door. And my reaction was so weird because it's like I didn't know that, even though I already do know that, that he left. And I go, what? And I feel like the presence of my, of my earthly father un, unhold me and starts to walk out this door. And I can't move. And I'm screaming, no, don't leave. Don't leave. Please don't leave me. Promise me you'll come back. Ugh. Don't cry. Don't cry at me. And uh, he walks out the door. It took a really long time for him to walk out the door. It was like really slow. And then when he walks out the door, Jesus runs up to the door. And he had like this bucket and this paintbrush. And he painted the door red with the blessed lamb. And then he comes to me and he holds me. And he said, it's okay. You're safe now. You're free. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. And I'm crying and I'm weeping in, in Jesus' arms. And he told me, he said, you can grow up now. Oh, I love God so much. It's bringing me tears of how I got freed. Because I... I expressed this two weeks ago. This was like my struggle was literally a setup. I was ta- telling you guys of what was happening in my life two weeks ago. And God was like, okay, I heard you. Let's fix it. Because that was a burden I had on my heart for, oh my gosh, over a decade. And when Jesus told me that it's time to grow up, he said, I'm ready to refurnish this place. Oh my gosh, that was so relieving. And I felt everything off of me literally just leave. Then I like wake up from this little vision I'm having and I'm just praising the Lord. And I'm just like, God, thank you for showing me that. Thank you for putting me through that. Because I, one, could have never done that on my own. And two, didn't even realize how much was let in. I thought it was one person. That made me feel like this and made me have this abandonment issues. It's like, no, there were so many things that came into my house that was dirty and messing things up. And I just, I had to get rid of it because a five-year-old was controlling the household and she just wanted to be heard and loved and seen. And the only person who could satisfy her is Jesus. And what's funny is after I uh, had this vision. God told me a very specific verse. I didn't know this on the top of my head either. I've heard this verse before, but I didn't know what what book, what chapter. He said, Matthew 10, 14. I had no idea what that was. I turn, I look, and what does it say? If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off of your feet and it was so intentional that all these men had dust like in my vision they were dirty they had dust on them shake the dust off your feet do not welcome them in your home and oh god is so real and what ended up happening is this vision happened and i went up to zach and i told him what happened? And I was like, God gave me this vision. It's so crazy. I'm, I'm like set free and stuff. Like th- this needs to be said. I don't know. I, I don't know. Like God just worked. And Zach was like, you need to go up there and you need to say what, what just happened. And I went up there and I said what happened. And I just like, quite honestly, I don't even know what I said. Cause I just like God completely 
orchestrate the whole it, it was on the top of the dome it was just like i just shared my testimony like how i'm doing right now i just i just shared what happened to me and i i kid you not y'all in that same very moment as i let go of that i've that like bitterness that i was dealing with it just like i felt this like bitterness go away i felt this anger go away and this anguish and this selfishness just release like I just wanted to hug people. I wanted to love people and just show the love of God after that. Like right after that happened, all I wanted to do was jump around, spin around and hug people and love people and pray for people. And that's what I did the rest of that night. And this is just my testimony. There's so many other things that happen with different people. uh, And they... They have some crazy stuff, uh, amazing stuff that happened to them. So I'm, I'm very blessed that I was there that night and that God used me and that God showed me that and that God freed me most of all from something that's been hurting me for a long time. And later that night, as I'm worshiping, when God said no more, I, I, I re-asked him, I said, what is it that you want no more of? No more like letting it in? Because I can't let it in. Because you painted the blood of the lamb on that door. So nothing can come through. And he says, straight up. He says, no more dating. I go, oh. Then he said, wait on me. And I said, oh. Because what's crazy is the past few months, I was like, you know what? I'm going to know somebody, the one, if they pursue me, if, you know, they, they just got sent. If they know, I'll know. And God said, no, you're not going to do it that way. I'll let you know. Okay, God. (laughs) Okay. So now that I got freedom, I was able to receive instruction. That's what's so cool about when, when you become free from something. And I want you guys to, like the things that you need to kick out of your house, the things that are collecting dust in your home. This doesn't have to be a person. This can be an addiction. This can be an emotion. This could be a person. This could be a thing. This could be a place. You need to tell those things to go because you won't be able to receive instruction from God until you have room to catch something. Because we will go to things like, let me just, let me just illustrate this real quick, okay? If you're watching, you'll get this. Okay. We, we are trying to receive, if you're listening, I have three pillows in my phone in my hands. We have all of these things that are not serving us. And we go to God and we say, God, give me instruction. Give me a purpose. Give me a plan. And he's going, you don't even have room to catch it. You don't even have room to receive it. You need to what? Let go of the things that are not serving you, that are not according to your purpose, your my will, and be in a posture to receive. And you can't receive if you don't let go. You cannot get a new revelation until the things, the chains, the burdens, the wounds that are suppressing you and holding you to the ground are cut off. And now you could be in a posture to receive. And God illustrated that for me. He said, Emmy, I need you to let this go. Because in order for you to step into the next season of your life, you need to step out of the very place that's holding you hostage. And I think the first step to letting go is by realizing you're in the wrong for allowing it for so long. I was prideful and I was wrong for keeping those same very things that were hurting me entertained. In a place they should have not been. You could be a victim. Sure. I, I, I agree that things that have happened to me have not been fair. Have not been okay. But I could choose to keep entertaining it. 
like I told you like how I had this bitterness like last week, just this ongoing bitterness towards my parents and this physical touch and just like, why am I irritated? People piss me off. I don't know what's going on. And when I was able to be free, that bitterness just sort of went off me. Oh, so God, I've been asking for peace and love. And now that that bitterness is gone, that I was entertaining and holding on to, I can now receive the very thing that I was praying for and that I'm destined for. I want to challenge you guys this week. I really want you to to be in a prayer with God. Sorry, I had to pop my knuckles. Y'all want to hear it? That was nice. Sorry. (laughs) I have a challenge for you guys this week. I want to challenge you to, to pray with God, to sit down with him and have a real conversation about what's in your house. What's collecting dust? What are the things that are holding you back? Whose chest are you laying in? We even talked about this with Samson and Delilah. Whose lap are you laying in? Are you laying in a lap that is deceiving you and telling you lies? Or setting you up? What's in your house that's collecting dust? What do you need to look in the eye and say, get out? Because your house cannot be refurnished until everything inside of it is gone. What are those things? Ask God to give you clarity, identification, and most of all that he gives you strength and all the things that are going to be let go of, it's going to be be because of his power and not with yours. You're just choosing to say yes. That's the only thing you're doing is having a choice. So ask God to give you identification. Get these things out of your house. And as soon as you get it out of your house, refill your heart with something new with love, with joy, with his sovereignty. Chains will break when you let go. You got to dig deep. Don't just look at the surface area. I thought I had a dating issue. No, I had a daddy issue. I had an abandonment issue. And I couldn't fix all this boy stuff until I fixed my my abandonment stuff. And debunking the lie of thinking I was alone and betrayed. I was never alone because Jesus Christ was there holding me, speaking life over me, loving me, comforting me, enjoying me. And he's the one who went over to the door Cover, covered it in the blood of the lamb and make sure to make sure that it doesn't come back. He is securing me. He's making me safe. He has never forsaken me or abandoned me or left me. And when you're satisfied in the presence of God, all of those things that were in your house are rubbish. That night at, at Circuit Riders, Lifestyle Christianity, love y'all, that you hosted in my hometown at Fresno. Shout out Fresno, that's where I'm from. People don't know where I'm from. I'm actually not from Fresno. I live on the outskirts of it, but I'm gonna say I'm from Fresno as a general as a generalization, because I don't want to get too specific where I'm from, because I don't want people to find me. <laughs> uh, but I be out in LA all the time. If you if you want to know where I'm at the most, I'm in LA every single week for work. Uh, anyways. Absolutely life changing, and I felt set free, set free. I felt like I could love people on a on a level that I wasn't able to love people before, and then I was able to find more forgiveness in people who have hurt me, like my family members, my friends. I was able to forgive more. I was able to be more graceful. And I'm still practicing this because um, this is so spiritual. And when your spirit is working, your flesh is dying and your flesh is going to do any and everything it can to combat it. Like I just learned yesterday that in your prayer, this is what's crazy. I'm telling you, I'm learning so much the past few days. When you're praying, it's my mind. When you're praying, my mind just kind of goes all over the place. I'm thinking, 
okay, what do I got to eat right after this? Oh, I got to work at this time today. I got to edit this video. I got to clean my room. I got to call this person. I need to text this over. I need to post this. My mind is just nip, 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 all over the place while I'm praying my sacred time with the Lord. And it has... It's so weird because it's like, I'll have this hunger for Jesus. And then it's like, I'll get to my prayer time. And then I'm like, I don't want to do this. That's so terrible. I'm I'm actually confessing this right now because I, I, I got the revelation from it. And I actually get to the action of praying and I'm like, you know what? I don't feel like doing it anymore. Why is that? Because when your spirit's in charge and it has dominion over your flesh your flesh hates that. So when the ruler of your body, which is usually your flesh, which so when the ruler of your body, which is usually your flesh, sees the spirit taking authority, your flesh is like, oh no, nah, this is not gonna happen. Romans seven eight. Romans Romans chapter seven and eight explains all this. I bring it up all the time because it's so pivotal. And your flesh is going to attack your spirit in any way possible. So why do you think all these intrusive thoughts come up in your prayer? Why do you think you start thinking things you shouldn't be thinking about when you're at church? Why do you start thinking things and doing things when you're in a place that glorifies the Holy Spirit? It's because your flesh hates it. And when your spirit is taking dominion, your flesh is going to wage war against you. And that's what I'm, that's what I've been doing th- these past few days is it's been so spirit led that my flesh is like, nah, let's go back to the bitterness. Remember what she did to you? Remember how she hurt you? And those are the things that are just knocking at my door, the door that was sealed. My job is to not open it. My job is to keep it closed. And and that's kind of what I'm, I, 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 I spiritually feel satisfied. I spiritually feel like I could all, do all things through Christ. I spiritually feel free. But my flesh doesn't like how my spirit is taking dominion. So... The very next day, I go to L.A. and I go see Jackie Hill Perry. And if you don't know this woman, I would highly encourage you to watch her because she I, I, I'm more impressed with her theology. I'm very impressed with how intelligent she is in in theology. And she explains things not only so poetically, but simple enough for you to understand it, but yet it's so detailed. She she doesn't try to sound all smart. But she is really smart. She still sounds smart. But she, she doesn't try to use big fancy words to make up for her disobedience or for her lack of knowledge. Like she, it, it, it's very straight to the point and it's very theologically backed up. I go and I see her and I, I didn't really plan on what I wanted to tell y'all about that today. I just wrote down the uh, the notes I did from her sermon. But what I felt as if God told me in that, because on that Monday, it was, okay, I'm wanting to be redeemed. I'm going into this field to glean. I want to be redeemed, Lord, just like Ruth. It happens. That that next few days, I got free, got set free, and God was so gentle and patient and kind with me. And then the next day when I see Jackie O'Berry, it was like, okay, now say sorry. Now take accountability. Because I go into... Uh, <laughs> I go into this not knowing what to expect. All these days lined up with one another. It was so crazy. I go into this not knowing what to expect. And... uh Jackie said, some of you are not fully satisfied with Christ and you need to repent for being unsatisfied with the cross. Y'all, I didn't even know I needed to repent for that. And I didn't know I actually felt that way. 
And I said, wow, yeah, my flesh feels completely unsatisfied. And the reason as to why I wasn't able to find satisfaction was because I wasn't able to let go of the unsatisfaction. So in that very moment, I said to God, she convicted the dog crap out of me. I looked at God and I said, Jesus, I'm so sorry that I have denied and not been appreciative and satisfied in what you've done to, in what you've done for me. No matter how significant or insignificant the the measure of the dissatisfaction was, I'm sorry, I did it in the first place. And I, I heard him tell me, he said, you weren't even able to know what it's like to be satisfied in me because you were so focused on being unsatisfied with me. And I go, yep, that's it. God, I'm sorry. I said, I don't want that anymore. I don't want to be unsatisfied with you. I hate, I hate that my flesh even feels like that. I just heard him say, I forgive you. He forgave me. And then from there, God was like, Look, this is this is the road of satisfaction. God was just showing me how things were aligned. He's like, this is your redemption. You're going to be satisfied in this redeeming process because we went to the root of your wounds. We removed the bullet and now it can actually heal. And we can refurnish your house and kick the dust out of your out of your door and dust it off your feet. And, it, and it's funny how it started with hope. Then it went to, to addressing my burden, being set free from it. Then saying sorry for even entertaining it for so long. And now I just feel encouraged. And now I'm like, if my huge, if future husband is watching this, don't talk to me right now. Wait, please, please wait. <laughs> Till God says so, because I can't date nobody right now. I'm low key scared. I'm like, oh my gosh, God, what if like a really fine man of God come my way? And he's like, Emmy, I love you. Am I supposed to say no? <laughs> nah, my future husband would wait on me if God says so. But that's just jokes. Jesus just moved so crazy, dude. And I came back home and I'm just Holy Spirit whipped, basically. I I feel like he wrecked me. <laughs> I I feel so much more encouraged and so motivated to keep pursuing and longing after him. And it couldn't have happened at a better time. And like I said, I'm going to come on here and be transparent with y'all. And I think the, the thing I'm trying to learn out of this is I can love people and love things that I, how, how to explain this? I can love from a distance because I had to let go of some people like spiritually that I was idolizing. I don't want you to think I let go of these people in a in a physical manner. Like, nah, we're not talking anymore. Like, you're cool. Like, no, we're not talking. No, I let go of them spiritually because I was idolizing them. I was idolizing men over God. And it's because I just wanted the satisfaction from, from man. So I had to let that go. I had to let the idol go. But you would still love people. But keep your distance. Like, I could still love you. But I'm not going to idol you. So finding that balance, I could love you from a distance. So when it came down to like my birth father, I could love him from a distance. Because I know that obviously I don't see him. I'm not in relationship with him. So I have to love him from a distance. I have to love him on a spiritual level. Not idolize him or idolize the thing that I, I've been lacking from him. But fill that hole with God and his love and his mercy and his grace and all the stuff that I'm lacking in, I'm going to trust in the Lord that the Lord is going to provide it and not the people that I was pursuing. Does this make sense? So I could love you, but I'm going to keep my distance because no one can break into this house. No one. 
Windows are bulletproof. You can't reach me. You can't. And God is just going to move. So I, I, I say this every week, but it's just like God is just going to keep going and going and going and going. And this walk gets harder. <laughs> and I think that's the thing I'm nervous about <laughs> is because I thought I've confronted the worst of the worst stuff like last year. No, I got wrecked and I'm still uh, in the process of learning to remain in this and not just get in on a mountaintop experience and just, yeah, great weekend and go back to my old ways. No, that's not the, that's not the vibe. That's not the plan. And that's not what I'm doing. If you feel encouraged by this, but like, let me know your story. Let me, let me know what you guys are thinking about this. Because I love to hear how God's moving in your guys' lives. Either you can DM me or put down a comment or whatever. God is so good. God is so good. And my plan from here on out is to just, if I, if I have a thought or a temptation to just Jesus it out. Jesus, 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 Jesus. If I, if I, if I have a thought or if I'm fantasizing about something or if I'm moving differently, just immediately going to his word, being in his presence and saying his name. Like if I think something negative, just Jesus, 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 Jesus. If I feel like being bitter, Jesus, 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 Jesus. <laughs> Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, come before me. But that's how God's been moving. And my testimony is just going to grow from here on out. It's just going to evolve. And that's going to be interesting. <laughs> I'm just so excited to see how God's going to move in this and how he's going to allow me to help you guys. And I know he's been, but uh, I don't know. I feel something really special in, in just being more vulnerable and straight up with y'all. Because if I'm not, y'all are going to have nothing to relate to and no one to speak about things that really need to be spoken about. And I'm kind of scared that it's me who's in that position, but God really doesn't want it any other way. He wants me to do this. Trust me, I don't want to come on here and tell y'all my life issues for everybody to hear. I don't want that. But if God says so, and if people are going to be saved, I got to. So uh, if any of my old friends or family members that have dissed me and, you know, hate them from a distance, listen to this podcast and y'all are mad that... <laughs> I talk about things like I'm I'm sorry, but I need to abide by the Lord before I abide by you. And I'm not scared of nothing. I only fear the Lord. So people just gonna have to get over it. That things have to be talked about. That's my job. People want this job until they hit it. And you gotta tell all your business. But I'm blessed because God's working. And uh that makes up for every single transgression or a weird comment that I get, like just God's glory and how He's shining and saving people and whatnot. I'm very abundantly blessed. I'm so thankful for you guys. A few announcements. Um, same announcements as always. If you feel led to tithe towards this ministry, uh, the tithing link is down below. If you've ever gotten saved from this podcast, there's a link down below that says, I just got saved. And then um, if you need prayer by any means, there's also another link that says, I need prayer all under the description of this video. If you're listening on Spotify, Spotify or Apple music, it will be in the link of my Instagram and my link tree, and it will just be set up that way. Um, if you guys need anything super specific, uh, please DM me. I try to be as active as possible. Um, what else? I think that's it. I think that's all the announcements. I'm, I'm so, oh, I kind of want to ask y'all what you think about this. I'm going to make an Instagram story about it. But what do you guys think if I, well, I know a lot of the people who follow me are from LA. Um, 
How would you guys feel if I hosted a public worship night and Bible study or an event out in LA? Would you come? How do you feel about that? Let me know. It's been on my mind. I've been praying about it. So just let a girl know. We'll make something shake. I'm praying about it though. So it's not for sure. It's just an idea. Um, but I want to know if people will come, come first, you know? So yeah, I'm gonna keep it at that. I think we good. I love you guys so much. Have a blessed rest of the week. I'm praying for you. I love you. God sees you. He hears you. He loves you. And I'm gonna see you two Tuesdays from now. So God bless and love you guys. Bye.